Our third and final speaker for this session is Carrie Vaughn. Carrie is the Chief of Staff for the Center for Effective Altruism, co-founder of EA Global, and also co-founder of Effective Altruism Ventures. Carrie is also completing a PhD in philosophy, which is focused on applied ethics and value theory. Prior to joining the Effective Altruism movement, Carrie ran the Technology and Innovation Department at the Laura and John Arnold Foundation and was also a professional poker player. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Vaughn. Hey, y'all. How's it going? Can everybody hear me okay? Cool. So, as you mentioned, my name's Carrie Vaughn. I am the co founder of Effective Altruism Ventures, chief of staff for the Center for Effective Altruism. I was also the co founder of Effective Altruism Global. And before I get started, I just want to send a quick shout out to my wife, Lauren, who stayed up until the early hours of the morning to make sure I had some beautiful slides for my presentation. So, thanks, hon. So what I'm going to talk about is improving the effective altruism network. Um, so one way to think about what effective altruism is, is it's kind of like two steps. It's figure out how to do the most good and then do it. Obviously, those are simple steps, but it's a hard thing to do in practice. And what I want to talk about is how we can accomplish the goals of this community uh, through greater coordination and through thinking of EA as a network that we can improve. So my talk's going to have three parts. First, I'm going to talk about EA as a network effect. Second, I'm going to talk about how we can improve the EA network. And then finally, I'll talk about how we should sort of think of ourselves as effective altruists, given that EA is a network which has network effects. So uh, we're in the Bay, so a lot of people know what a network effect is. But for those who don't, um, a network effect occurs when a product or service becomes more valuable to its users as more people use it. The classic example here is the telephone network. So imagine you've just invented telephones, and there are only two in existence. One, Lucy has one, and Ethel has the other one. Um, the telephone network here, you, you might ask, like, how valuable is that, is that telephone network? And a sort of straightforward way of thinking about it is, well, since phones are designed to help you call people, the more phones, the more valuable the network is. In this case, you can make one call, or there's one connection, which is between Lucy and Ethel. But now let's imagine we increase the size of that network. Now we have five phones. There are actually 10 possible connections here, even though we've only increased the number of phones by four. So as that phone network grows, um, the network gets more valuable. And then if you extend it to 12, you've got an increase in seven phones, but 66 possible connections. So the way these network effects work is as you add more to the network, everybody gets value from that, and the total value of the network increases more rapidly than the people you're adding. Um, the sort of like mathematical way of thinking about this is known as Metcalfe's Law. Um, and that says that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users in the system. And you know, that's the sort of basic equation um, up there on the screen. Um, I think EA has network effects um, in two places in particular, but probably in a bunch of other ones that I didn't think of. Um, so the first is in comparative advantage. So one thing that's really nice about the EA community is we can all specialize in different skills and in different abilities, and then that becomes a source of value for everybody that's a part of the EA community. So you can be really good at making money, and you can donate your money to other projects. You can develop specialization in talking to other people about the community, in direct work, you know, marketing, uh, what have you. And since you can just develop that one skill and use other people's skills to complete what you need to do your project, that's kind of a, a boost to everybody. And so the more people who have specialized skills in the network, it's better for everybody in accomplishing their goals. Um, the second way that we have network effects is through the marketplace of ideas. So this is the, uh, the idea that if you have ideas compete in a free sort of open market, the truth tends to emerge. And um, if that's the case, then more ideas competing, more experience, more background that people bring to the table, um, the better ideas we'll get, and then that benefits everybody. OK, so basic idea, EA has network effects, and I explained what network effects are. So given that framework, which I think turns out to be a pretty powerful framework for understanding um, the EA community, what are some ways that we can increase the value of the EA network? And what are some ways that we might accidentally decrease the value of the network? And I'm going to talk about five. So first, a way that you can decrease the value of the EA network is through dilution and transaction costs. So um, let's go back to our phone network. Imagine there are two phones, and those are the only options for who you can contact. Um, but the way that phone network works is that instead of being able to dial a number and talk to somebody directly, it connects you with a different phone at random. So if you had the original two-phone network and you wanted to talk to the other person, you're always going to get that person. 
But when you have the other 10 phones, now you get a 1 in 11 chance of talking to whoever it is you want to talk to. And I would argue that even though that network's larger, so you might think it's more valuable given the way network effects work, um, that network is actually less valuable to the people involved because it's harder to get the value out of the network. So you have to spend a lot of time, probably, calling and hoping that you randomly get the person you actually want to talk to, and you have to sort of keep doing that to get any value out of this network. So that's less valuable despite an increase in size. Um, thinking about this from the EA context, a way that we can accidentally decrease the value of the network is if we add a bunch of people to the network that aren't really that interested in the ideas that are important to effective altruists. So let's imagine we ran EA Global, but instead of 1,000 people, it was 10,000 people. And 10% of those were EAs interested in improving the world, and 90% were sort of random people off the streets who we happened to pack into an auditorium. Um, I would argue that that's a less valuable conference, even though it's larger, because it's much harder to find people who are interesting and who uh, you, know, you want to engage with and can help you accomplish your goals. So um, one of the ways that we can accidentally decrease the value of the EA network is by making it harder to find the people you want to talk to, harder to find the value in the network, um, and that can make the, the network less valuable overall. Um, one way that we can increase the value of the EA network is uh, by adding variety. So um, using the phone example again, imagine you start out with 10 phones, and then you, add, you start out with two phones, and then you add 10 more. You might think, great, this is a much larger network. I can now talk to 11 other people. Awesome. But what if the 10 phones you added were all the same? So what if instead of adding 10 unique contacts, you had 10 Burger Kings to your phone network? So now your options for who you can call are one, your friend, two, Burger King, that's it. So even though the number of connections in this system has increased, the uh, variety hasn't, which means that you didn't get the kind of increase in value that you would have gotten from a phone network which added a bunch of unique connections to that network. So in the case of EA, we might think of variety, where that's um, people who have unique experiences, unique skills, as kind of a positive externality that's good for everybody. So if you bring in somebody who knows about a part of the world that nobody else in this community knows about, has experiences that other people don't have, everybody in the community can take advantage of that, talk to, those, to that person, and gain the advantage of their skills and their experience. Um, the other thing I should say is, uh, so. It's not the case that we don't want to add more people who have similar backgrounds and experiences to the EA community, because a lot of people are you know, extremely valuable either way. People differ a lot more between each other than they do, than like burger, burger chains differ between each other. Um, and uh, there's plenty of people in the EA community where I would just like want to stamp out a carbon copy of as many of them as I can get. Um, but the way to think about it instead is, if you have an opportunity to increase variety, that's good for everybody, and we should think of that as additionally valuable. Uh, the third phenomenon I want to talk about is something which makes it hard to get diversity, and I call it selecting on the correlates. So the basic idea here is for any group of people who share some primary trait, they likely also share a bunch of secondary traits that are correlated with the first primary trait. And since groups tend towards homogeneity, you can accidentally select for a bunch of these secondary traits which makes your group not as diverse and not having as much variety as you'd like to have. So um, to ex like, as an example, let's imagine you're uh, building the community of basketball players. You want the best basketball players you can find. And so you bring a bunch of people together. You look at who's good and who's not. You try and see like, what characteristics do they have. And you'll probably notice that they're tall, no surprises there, that they're fast, and that they're athletic. If you know anything about basketball, Obviously, those are, those are things that make you good at basketball. But you might also notice that they have some other things in common. They might all have back trouble. They might drive a truck or an SUV. And they might be urban instead of rural. And that's because those traits are presumably correlated with the first traits. So if you're tall, like I am, I have back trouble, and it's easier to have back trouble if you're taller. Um, it's harder to fold yourself into a small compact car if you're tall, so you might want to drive something larger. And then just like 80% of the people in the US are from urban environments instead of rural environments, so that's just more likely on base rates. Um, but if you didn't know how basketball worked, you didn't know what made you good at basketball, you might get confused. You might end up with a team of people who are tall and have back issues, because you thought that was the thing that you know, really made somebody good at basketball. So in the EA community, I think we're doing something similar, where we're accidentally selecting on the things that correlate with what we're looking for, instead of selecting for the, the actual traits themselves. So we're likely accidentally selecting for youth, 
And that's because people who are younger are maybe a bit more ambitious, think they can go change the world a bit more um, than if you're a little bit older. Um, we're probably selecting for disagreeableness. So if you're willing to argue with people and disagree, um, you might be more likely to uh, entertain unusual ideas and um, you know, to sort of take ideas like the effective altruism community has more seriously. And then we're probably also selecting for people who are politically liberal, just because the demographics we draw from tend to be more liberal than conservative, especially in the US context. So the, the key here in selecting on the correlates is that if we're going to increase variety in the EA community, you need to know what matters, select for that, and ignore the other stuff. So what we're looking for are altruistic people who uh, think analytically, or you know, the values that Tara talked about in her talk. That's what we're looking for. So find those people. You know, connect them with the community, and then you know, let the other stuff fall away, and don't worry about the other stuff. Um, another area I want to talk about is donor coordination. So um, I've been on kind of both sides of the table when it comes to raising money in the AA community. I ran a project called Effective Altruism Outreach and had to raise money there. And then I've also run Effective Altruism Ventures, um, which was a project that helped connect entrepreneurs with uh, and investors who wanted to you know, support their projects. And what I've noticed is that raising money in the EA community is really different from raising money in other contexts. So let's uh, imagine, for instance, that I am a big-time venture capitalist, and I'm with Google Ventures. And I meet an inventor who has an amazing product that I think is going to radically improve the world, probably make me a whole bunch of money. And after meeting with the inventor, I go back to my partners, talk to them, and we were thinking, OK, well, how much do we invest? And the answer to this is complicated. It depends on you know, how much money you have left in the fund and when you're going to fundraise and so on. But what's important to notice is you have an incentive to give a little bit more money than you might otherwise, because you're going to get compensated for that with more equity. So if you overinvest, give more money than the founder needs, that's fine. Um, and in, in addition, you will, might have to compete with other venture capitalists to actually get the deal. So you might have to offer more money for lower equity, better terms, and so on. Now let's imagine, instead, I'm Effective Altruism Ventures. So meet the same inventor, has an amazing product, I think it's really going to improve the world, how much should I invest? The answer boils down essentially to as little as I can, or as little as I need to to make the project successful. And the reason that's the case is because as an altruist who's focusing on um, just you know, improving the world, I don't care if I'm the one that gives the money to the, product, the project. I just care that the project comes into existence at all. And if I can get somebody else to do it, I can use my money to fund something else. So uh, that leads to a very different set of incentives and a very different uh, sort of funding environment than you might see in like a venture capital market. And I think this uh, leads to some unique problems that we have in donor coordination in the effective altruism community that don't exist elsewhere. So uh, I've got four. The first is a problem I call the minimum viable fundraise. So the way this works is if I'm starting a new project and I'm talking to donors, um, their incentive is to give me as little money as they can for the project to get off the ground. Because again, they don't get more equity, they don't get more good in the world, it would appear, by giving more money. So they just want to like test the project and see if they should keep giving money to it. The problem is that for founders themselves, um, this can cause them to make worse decisions than they would make otherwise in ways that are like a bit subtle and a bit hard to see. So they might not... Uh, grow the project as fast because they ended up with less money. They might uh, have a harder time recruiting because the funding is a bit more unstable. You know, there's some problems like that. So because of the because the uh, donors are acting in a rational way, giving small amount of money to see if the project works, we might be getting a globally worse solution to the problem of funding new projects. Another potential problem is what I call the last donor in problem. So if uh, you're strategic and you're altruistic and you just care about increasing value in the world and you're going to fund a new project, um, one strategy you could use is wait to see if the project's going to get funded or not. If it looks like it's not, swoop in at the last minute, give them the money, and fund it that way. And the reason you might do this if you're a funder is it makes it more likely that um, your funding is the reason the project is going to exist. So if you wait, maybe other people will fund it, you'll keep the money, and you'll give it to something else that you're also excited about. Um, so that seems to make sense. It's kind of a rational approach if you're a strategic, altruistic donor. But for projects, it means there's more uncertainty around funding, or it'll look like funding's going worse until later in the fundraising process. You might get false signals that people don't like your project. They're not, they're not willing to support it. And that can be bad for, for what other people think about the project. Um, and it can also create an incentive to kind of uh, present your project as a bit weaker financially than you might have otherwise if you were raising money in a venture capital market. 
Um, so again, donors are acting rationally, individually, but globally, maybe we're getting a slightly worse solution. Uh, the third is the funding uncertainty problem. So um, the tradition in effective altruism is that projects raise about 12 months of funding and like six to 12 months of reserves. And they usually raise once a year, twice a year, something like that. Um, and this is good for funders to fund in smaller increments because they can get more data, make a different decision on the basis of how the project's doing, and decide whether they want to continue investing in the project or not. Um, but for projects, it means it's harder to make long-term investments because you don't know how much money you're going to have six months from now, 12 months from now. Um, and it can mean that you're not making the sort of long-term plays that might create more value than uh, the sort of shorter-term thinking that you have to do if you're not sure you know, how much money you're going to be able to raise. And then finally, we have what I call the small donor problem. So if you are a smaller donor in the EA community, it probably doesn't make sense to spend a bunch of time and do a bunch of research to find the optimal charity to give to, because the time to value ratio is probably not going to be favorable. Um, so what you probably do is you give to um, a charity that has a lot of evidence, that's highly credible, and that's publicly available, and you use that to decide where you should donate. And that means probably giving to a giver or recommended charity, which is a great option. But if everybody does that, I think you might get a total pool of funding that is uh, less valuable than it could have been otherwise. So um, small donors might want to collect together, and they might want to fund higher risk, higher reward projects than give or recommended projects, like the kind of stuff that open philanthropy uh, project funds. They might want to fund um, projects that turn their money into more money to uh, give or recommended charities like Giving What We Can. Or they might want to pool their money and fund projects which need um, some set amount of money to launch it all, like a new startup. So while each of the donors are acting in a rational way individually, perhaps collectively they're not doing the thing that's optimal for the, for the EA network. And then the final sort of implication of thinking of EA as a network effect that I want to talk about is critical mass and critical decay. So one of the things that makes network effects really powerful in the venture capital market for, you know, for projects like Facebook and Twitter and PayPal is that when the network reaches a certain point, which they call critical mass, it becomes a good idea for uh, other people to join that network because they'll get value out of it. And then when people join the network, the network is now more valuable, which means more people have a reason to join it, which means it's more valuable, and so on. And that can lead to pretty rapid growth. Um, one way that we might think about the future of effective altruism is that we want to create that kind of critical mass that makes it a better idea to join the EA community, even just looking at your selfish goals, than it is to not join the EA community. So we could make a community which you know, networks you and connects you with people such that giving away 10% of your money is still better for your career and still better for how much money you have than doing otherwise. And I think if we can do that and do it in a way which brings people who maybe don't start out with the altruistic motivation um, be able to gain it, then um, that might be the key to sort of hyper growth in the EA community. Like that might be the way that we take EA and spread it worldwide if that's a, if that's a goal we should have. Um, the flip side of critical mass is critical decay. So the way this works is just like a network effect can you know, cause people to join and it gets more valuable, that can go in reverse. So something can happen which causes people to leave the EA network. That means the EA network is now less valuable, which means more people have a reason to leave, which means it's less valuable and so on. And the implication here for movement builders and for the EA community is that effective altruism might look more robust and stronger than it actually is. And it might be the case that if something happened where a number of people wanted to leave the community, that that would trigger a wave of other people leaving because the value of the network is decreasing. So I think we should think of EA as a really valuable, but also probably pretty delicate thing that we need to uh, sort of steer and work on together to make sure it accomplishes its goals. And then the final thing I want to talk about is what this means for how you think of yourself um, as an effective altruist and your, your kind of role in, in the community. Um, what I have on the screen here is how Will, in the book Doing Good Better, um, kind of introduces or explains effective altruism. And uh, I don't say this lightly, because Will is my boss, but I think he's actually got it wrong here. I think this isn't the best way to explain effective altruism. So uh, maybe I'll pause for a second, and you can sort of think about what, what might be wrong here, or what, what might I think is wrong with this kind of way of explaining it. So what I think the problem is, is this. I don't think effective altruism is about how I can do the most good or how I can make the biggest difference. I think effective altruism is about we. It's about how we can do the most good, how we can work together to make the biggest difference. Um, you know, the problems that effective altruists are trying to solve are too hard. 
the world is too big to only focus on your role in improving the world as opposed to the community's role together. So when you leave the conference at the end of today, when you go home, the buzz of the conference is worn off, and you're thinking about, you know, what should I do now? The question I want you to ask yourself is not how I can do the most good, but how we can do the most good. Thank you.